talk about uh, some of the things that they learned after the meeting that might not have been recorded, uh, which might be super useful for us, but um, we didn't get to see uh, on air. Uh, so I'm just going to break down the morning schedule a little bit after that. We'll have stress testing FFB1 and then FFB1 and metropolitan digitization and contextualization live demo, uh, demo of MediaConch and uh, some of our trust tools uh, from Steve. So I think that will kick us off. We will go to lunch and then we have uh, two talks in the afternoon, which we'll talk about at that time. And then we'll break and then we will go into a conference at um, 1440. <laughs> and uh, then we'll, we'll sort of work on uh, what maybe grow up what we talked about yesterday and, and take, turn those things into um, maybe more productive uh, takeaways. And then um, we'll close uh, after that. So that's our day. But right now it's Dave and Jordan. Hello there. So uh, I mean, you, you were probably there, most a lot of you, and, and saw what happened. Uh, but I mean, like one one thing I, you know, one thing I like about how this uh, symposium is arranged is that like it, it allows the archivists to to uh, see the standardization process rather than just be the reactors to it, uh, and the ones who kind of bear the problems of the faults of the standardization process. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, you know these, these formats have had a kind of a long history of, of developing in in kind of uh, local format based communities, and now that they're developing in a standards organization, the the way we kind of communicate and develop and prioritize uh, is, is is substantially different. Um, I think for all of, for uh, Steve and I, it was our first time being present at an IATF meeting. Jerome had experience, so he might have like hummed right away uh, when we didn't know what to do. <coughs> Um, but yeah, I guess I wanted to give each of us the opportunity to make uh, some, some statements about <coughs> it. Um, I find that I don't know how evident this was in uh, the stream, but to be present at that event without um, <coughs> good preparation in all the policy is a bit tense. Uh, it's, it's kind of unclear how, <coughs> how you can behave or what you are allowed to do, but it is very clear that there is an enormous amount of policy and understanding from the ITF participants. That, that kind of hangs out over everyone, and <clears throat> some of it is difficult to understand. Uh, I know, like when, I think in the stream you could see <coughs> that there was one microphone for speakers in the audience to cue, announce their name, and to speak. And then immediately behind that microphone is another cue and another microphone <coughs> for people to interrupt the person at the, the, the first microphone. So like I'd be speaking and then hear from behind me like <laughs> you know somebody else uh, to to ask clarifying questions or to give some reaction. <clears throat> uh, you know one thing I had mentioned at one point is that uh, talking about the workflow that like the there was a deadline of June eighth to hand in um, RFC drafts like you know the the very particular. Uh, formatting of the document that the IETF requires so that it could be uh, reviewed. We have to hand it in by the 8th so that there's, so then, then it's kind of closed and fixed in time up until the conference so that uh, people within the IETF have kind of a fixed, stable document on which to comment into, as uh, up, into, up, up until and while the conference is going on. The uh, uh, producing an RFC document is, is quite complicated. Um, in, <coughs> in our community, uh, there's, the, I mean, there are some from the ITF community involved in the solo working group, but a lot of us are, are coming uh, from elsewhere to work together. Uh, so the, the working practices for document formatting are, are certainly new to us. Um, a lot of us have familiarity with working in, in Markdown, and uh, so we had to find a method to take Markdown and convert it into an RFC. And this was an enormous challenge. So. Like, but uh, you know, eventually we have a make file that we can use at any point to convert um, the documents that we're working on and, and means that we feel comfortable into an RFC document uh, so that the IETF community can, can see it and, and we can participate in it in a way that is a bit more comfortable than working in an RFC document directly. Um, when I was uh, discussing this, I mentioned that uh, the deadline helped inspire a lot of uh, the work to, to get these documents ready in time. Uh, and, and kind of caused a 
some rush, and then the area director uh, got up to talk about how uh, he is happy and quite horrified to hear about uh, you know the kind of deadline driven approach. Um, yeah, so one one of the I mean I personally am quite deadline driven, so I think you know kind of one of the compromises here is to make more granular deadlines because like maybe if we have more smaller deadlines, then the deadline driven workload is not as um, impactful or certainly. <laughs> Um, another thing we kind of talked about after, uh, I did, this wasn't part of the stream, I believe, but uh, was about, like Tessa had at one point asked for strategies on like how to get uh, volunteers or advice, and then nobody gave her any advice, <laughs> so she just kind of sat there silently. Uh, afterwards, Tim was making a suggestion to say that if you, uh, if you want other ITF groups to review your documents, and they are not, you can... Uh, you should offer a trade to say, I will review your document if you review my document. Um, you know, this naturally takes more time, but uh, it's worth, you know, it's probably, a, you know, a worthwhile fair, fair trade to do that. Um, <coughs> you know, it, it's, uh, in the ITF, it's, it's an environment where, um, you know, a lot of people that are sponsored, like the workplaces kind of permit them to go, but it's, it's a very much a kind of a volunteer environment. Uh, so, um, you know, th these kinds of trading, I think, are, are are a good idea without necessarily putting uh, unfair expectation onto, onto other participants. Um, before um, before the, um, the meeting, uh, Tim Terry Ray, the co-chair, had sent a very long email of, uh, of things that we needed to do with the EBML document. Uh, we had thought that the EBML document was pretty close to done, but then got a very comprehensive set of documents, like picking apart every little piece and suggesting what we need to do. Um, I should say, like, this list includes uh, changes that need to be made that are quite simple, and then some that are quite complex. So I think a lot of the feedback that we've gotten in preparation of this meeting and during the meeting um, that we could use to help uh, facilitate anyone who might want to participate in the project because we have a lot to do and it has like a wide range of complexity. I think often like when you look at the, the mailing list, it gives uh, an impression that the discussions are quite specific and complicated. And um, you know, like I'll see threads that Jerome is on about F51 and I will understand that if I really want to participate and give feedback, I'm going to have to like invest a lot of time to sort of understand all that's being discussed uh, so that I can have an opinion on what the current status is. Um, but with a lot of the information we've gotten lately, I think I think a lot of it is, is sort of easier cleanup that we need to do. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad that if uh, the, the EVML document was adapted as a working group. Uh, thanks for coming remotely if you did. Um, uh, the Metroska document clearly has a long way to go. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I think we should do moving forward is that uh, the, the EBML is kind of this uh, foundational format uh, that Matroska is based upon, and it's not well, it's not so well known. Uh, the particulars are quite specific. There's not a lot of community knowledge about EBML, but there is a lot of community knowledge about uh, Matroska. So I think in the seller working group, we should kind of um, do more promotion to the review so that we can kind of look, you know, element by element at the metadata dictionaries, at recommendations for usages of chapters, and Attachments, you know, so that we can get communities like, you know, anime in particular, and, uh, in, you know, involved in, in the process um, and like vet, vetting the work as, as we go. Um, I mean, as, as we've seen kind of like by the presentation about uh, WebM, like they're like, you know, collaborating, like I'm coming from a preservation context, but, but collaborating even with the most modern usages of, of the format, like, you know, have a lot of benefits. Um, we shouldn't, you know, our company shouldn't work on the standards alone, like certainly in collaboration is, is a lot more powerful. Yeah, so that's my feedback on the idea. Uh, I don't know, what's going on? Probably Jerome, I bet, he's so eager. <laughs> <laughs> you said uh, almost everything. <laughs> I don't know exactly what to add. Um, there is some discussion about the video codec, what we should put uh, in the video codec directly, or what we should put in the container. Put in the container and uh, we will have some disagreement about uh, which path we should have, uh, which path we should use. So we will try to, uh, to make everyone happy in this working group and we, we, we will try to find solutions. 
Um, there was more an official discussion after the official part with the video part, and from my point of view, actually, uh, the most interesting part uh, at EATF it is after um, the official part, surprisingly. <laughs> so, uh, when you are remote, actually, you don't have everything, and uh, it is pretty important to be on site, actually. Um, yeah. I think that's all for us. Yeah, there are some uh, about new features to add to FFB1, X prizes, uh, uh, color space, and more information about colors. So it is interesting for archivists to in order to be able to save everything. But this is the stuff we don't know if we put that in FFB1 directly or in Matroska. There, there will be a discussion about that uh, later on the Stellar mailing list. Um, so, um, I think in this room, maybe except for Kieran, I'm probably the one who has the most knowledge about IT here because I come from the network programming. Uh, that was my background in programming, a lot of network stuff. So, I, was, I read a lot of RFCs, a lot of work of IT stuff, and from other documentation I've been uh, looking at throughout my life. Um, I think that they were the most comprehensive, the more useful, and uh, basically uh, stuff like HTTP and, uh, and RTP and RFE. But a lot of the basis of the internet is based on the <coughs> specification that they designed. So I had a high uh, opinion on their work. So I was expecting yesterday to, uh, uh, to be very technical and hard. It was actually not very technical and not very hard, and I was a bit surprised. And uh, because it seems the meeting are more like also to show that uh, you actually very involved and very willing to go through it, uh, rather than just having it because the whole group was creating mostly online with creating in many ways the working group with Tessa. And, uh, but if, um, if nobody joins the group or nobody sends email, nothing happens. So I think it's also important with the deadlines also to have people come and show, yes, we are there, we really want this to happen. And that's also a way to get traction and get more people involved in the process. Uh, from people here. Um, so yeah, so for me, the ITF is one of the I highly uh, recommend, and so I'm very happy to work uh, through them. It's complicated because the, the documentation requirements are high standards, and coming from the documentation I wrote, it's a long way. Uh, but when Dave is doing most of the work of changing what I did into something better. I didn't have much time to help him lately, but hopefully I'll have, I'll have more work to help him during the next month. Can you talk a bit about the framework dilemma that you were talking about before? Yes, there's, um, I also talked about it on Monday uh, as a side job that the, the frame rates and basically the time stamps on Matroska are kind of floating points which for preservation and have something very precise, it's not very nice floating points. The values are not always precise, and especially if you multiply it, which is happening on the first um, So we already started in a while ago to look if there was a, a way to use rational numbers rather than floating points and change that in the format. Um, I think it might be possible, but we have to look closely. Uh, if it's possible, for sure, uh, but that could be backward <coughs> incompatible, and that's something we want to avoid, even if we create a, a next version of Matroska, for just for that. Uh, so that's something we, we are going to work on and see if we can improve it. <coughs> I mean, one of the assumptions I had kind of about our work, like 
trying to, I mean, I didn't get the reaction I expected. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've worked a lot with metadata standards, and I'm familiar with using XML schemas and XML documents. And <coughs> Matroska is, uh, you know, designed upon a binary equivalent of XML. So I thought <coughs> it would uh, it'd be a good idea to just kind of ex exploit the benefits of that analogy and have, um, you know, an email schema compared to this that works in the same way as an XML schema does, so that you can have a machine-readable document that you can use to, to do validation and uh, to create documentation. Uh, there's a lot of metadata standards that the, you know, the most authoritative document for the metadata standard is the XML schema, and the XML schema can be used to produce uh, human-readable documentation. And that's the, the current approach in the eBML draft, that we have an XML that represents the structure and constraints of Matroska, and then we produce documentation from that, and uh, the area director thought that was strange to have like the XML document be normative, like not the human readable part. So I don't know. I'm gonna definitely kind of follow up with um, you know some of you know some of the other working groups that have kind of faced this dilemma before to get a little bit more experience, you know, on, on how to proceed with this approach. According to him, it's not very common to XML that's normative. They didn't have. Uh, another thing was uh, discussing, like, should the Matroska specification be broken up? Um, there's, there's like a large part of the documentation that's about the, um, the you know, the, the metadata vocabulary and taxonomy, where it's like all the official terms and their definitions. Um, like, what, you know, one of the reasons I think we found to, to break it up is that we could version the taxonomy uh, distinctly from Matroska. Like, for instance, if we had more official values to document, uh, you know, particular like preservation or administrative or technical metadata, uh, we could do that specifically in a standard of Matroska's um, metadata and not in the Matroska standard itself, which I think is would help kind of you know clean it up a bit, so we don't have to version the entire thing to to affect one small category of the project. Well, sorry, we could take uh, questions about this process if you have any. Could you define what is meant by normative XML? Oh, yikes. Okay. I, okay, so in the, the uh, RFC documents, uh, there's a mandate for a references section uh, so that you explain what what knowledge the document is building upon. And there are two types of references. I think normative means that you have to have a, a full comprehension of that reference in order to understand the document that you read. So in the case of uh, like Matroska, for instance, for a lot of the aspects of Matroska, you need to understand eBML to understand Matroska. Like, you, like if you had the Matroska specification alone, you'd be missing some context. Like you wouldn't be able to like implement it in a, in a player, for instance. I can't remember what the other type of reference is called. It's not normative, but it's Else. And it's uh, there are citations and references to documents that are clarifying and helpful, but not knowledge that is like you know mandated to, to be understood before understanding the main document that you're in. Is it informational? Could be. That sounds good. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, any other questions about ITF standardization? Good morning, guys. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're on time. Yeah, we're supposed to end right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to introduce the next uh, two talks. Uh, I can't remember who was first. Is it Peter or Pierre? Um, same, same slot, so it's... Oh, all right. No, no, I just put it there. I... Oh, that's all I did. Yeah, this is a big one. Yeah. yeah. Should we have an audience vote who goes first? All right, I... Uh... Oh, that's fine. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I think uh, maybe Kate talked about this a bit in her, her uh, presentation, the, the relationship of test files to a specification and you know, what test files can do. So, um, both Peter and Kieran have uh, worked in, in using uh, you know, files for testing uh, products and in, in a way that has created like, probably hundreds and thousands or potentially millions of, of files. Um, the, the results of these, these two projects were kind of handled in very different ways and had different conclusions, but doing these kind of massive comprehensive tests uh, definitely helps find bugs in the implementation, but also 
kind of reveals where in the specification you might need to clear things up or make them more specific. Uh, so I want to introduce Karen and Peter to talk about the yeah, projects that they were involved yes. in. All right, it's Karen. 